thank you very much. Um, I'll come on to what I feel about the award at the end, because um, that's how I wrote it in the notes, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick to that. Um, but just to say thank you very much, I'm truly, truly honoured to receive this. Um, so I'm going to talk to you this evening. Um, I, I wanted to get away from the usual motivation pitch, which I do every week, usually to blag money from people or give some kind of some kind, um, and just tell you about how on earth I got here. Because this is what, when I got the letter uh, from Matthew Taylor telling me about this, it, um, I've been mulling this talk ov over and over in my head, mainly while I've been away on holiday in the last month. Um, for a couple of weeks, and uh, I just thought, well, how on earth did I get to this point? And I thought I'd explain that um, beyond just what Andrew's told you in the, in the, in the summary. Um, I've called this talk Freedom Through Design. Freedom Through Design was our first strap line, if you like, at Motivation. Um, Simon and Richard and I dreamt up the name. Um, uh, it was really a, a Simon's idea, and uh, we had to put a name of an organization down in our first application form. So Richard and Simon rang me up one night and said, we've got to put a name down for this thing. We haven't even got a name. But Simon suggested a project name that he used at, uh, during his BA course. It's called Motivation. What do you think? And I said, sounds great. So we put it down. And actually, we've grown into that name. And we called, uh, we, 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 we underwrote it with Freedom Through Design, and that's why I've called this talk Freedom Through Design, because... It meant as much about what we were getting from and, and motivation was giving us, particularly for Richard and I, because I was escaping from IBM and Richard was escaping from Corporate World of Coopers and Librand to do what we do now. And it was our freedom through design. And, and re but really it was about the freedom we felt we could hopefully give people through the design that we would take to other countries. So I'm going to take you through how on earth I got here um, without being a, a sort of potted history. But um, for me, it all started really in 1982. I've had really no schooling in, um, in design before that point. Uh, when I um, had an injury in Australia, um, became a quadriplegic at level C4-5. And if I look back as to what I felt about it at the time, it sort of made me feel like I was on some sort of island because when I came um, through that process of being rehabilitated, I was given a chair like this chair here, uh, which had been designed in 1932, not in 1982. It was a fantastic breakthrough design for its day. Unfortunately, 50 years later, they were still giving it to people. And it's still not that bad a design for the context it was designed for, uh, which was a sort of rehabilitation situation of US, returning US servicemen, and it was a great chair for its time. Um, so I felt very much on an island, both in terms of the fact that I was suddenly stuck in this thing that was big, bulky, and I felt very away from people, other people. I couldn't embrace people, I couldn't. And I lost the sensation also from here down but importantly, I lost the sensation in my hands. And that made me feel quite cut off, in both in terms of the physical barriers of the chair, but when I, shake hands, when I shook hands with Andrew just now, I had no idea I was touching his hand or skin even, that it was warm or cold. And beyond looking at what, where my hand went, I had no idea where my hand is. So I don't know that I'm touching plastic or wood or rubber or anything. And that, and that has a a feeling of cutting you off from other people, but uh, uh, as well f uh, from products. And I suddenly found that all the possessions I owned didn't feel like mine anymore. And the most important thing to me was my camera. And suddenly I couldn't even feel my camera and I couldn't even pick it up. Um, so the chair was not only a physical barrier, but um, this sort of lack of sensation, particularly in my hands, I felt. And I mean, that chair, I was at a, a, a conference once with, with a load of rehab uh, people and uh, some other wheelchair users, and I was sort of slightly maligning the Everest and Jennings design chair in developing countries. And this consulting rehabilitation consultant got up and said, well, David, I don't think you're being quite fair to Everson Jennings. It was a breakthrough design of its day. In fact, it was the Rolls-Royce of its day. 
And he was absolutely right. And another wheelchair user then got up after him and said, yes, the Rolls-Royce of wheelchairs, heavy, expensive, and really hard to manoeuvre. <laughs> Which was also true. But uh, luckily, about a year after my injury, I, or leaving hospital, I was able to get the first sort of, one of the first active-style chairs that came to the UK. And it literally changed my life overnight. Not only that, it changed the people's lives around me, the people who helped me you know, get up on obstacles and, and my assistants and my family and friends and so on. And that was life-changing. And suddenly I could adjust this thing to the way I wanted it to sit, not the way Mr. Everest decided I should sit or the NHS thought I was safe to sit. And so I was lucky. I do feel quite pleased that I did my time in that chair. I wrecked one in nine months, sent it back, and they gave me another one. Um, as Andrew said, I went from Oxford Poly, uh, now Brooks University, and I got a very good job at IBM. My parents thought I'd landed for life, I think. So when I announced two years later, or 18 months later, that I was thinking of leaving IBM and doing a course in industrial design at this art college, they were somewhat horrified. Um, but they were very supportive in that. They realized actually it was something I really wanted to do. I was actually quite unhappy at motivate, um, <laughs> slip, um, uh, at IBM because it was, I'd realized I'd taken on a job as a junior programmer and I didn't really want to be a junior programmer. I took it on because I'd done a computing degree. And I realized that actually sort of compromised what I wanted to do in my life because of my disability. Um, and I wasn't using the skills I'd learned to, to the full at all. And what I felt very stifled about was any form of creativity. And I hadn't really realized until then that I needed some outlet of creativity. And that really had been through my photography. And I'd struggled a few times um, to get my camera working again for me by making various different wheelchair design mounts on, on my chair. But um, that, they hadn't really worked. Um, and during my time at IBM, I was very lucky to be given sort of different periods in my first year as a graduate employee to go into different departments. And one of those departments was, of course, I chose the photography department, which was a complete away from programming, which was great. What I landed up in was the design department because that held the photography department. They wouldn't let me do photography because the building wasn't accessible. So I ended up doing, uh, using a program, just laying out some graphics for one of the graphic designers. And meanwhile, I used to go for lunch with these three other guys who were working on these uh, big CAD machines. And I'd say, so what are you guys? What sort of designers are you? And they said, well, we're industrial product designers. And I said, so what does that mean? And they explained. This is over lunch one day in the IBM canteen. And I said, so you're the guys that put the switch for the monitor right around the back of the machine, are you? <laughs> OK. And you're the ones that make it really difficult for me to switch anything on because I can't use my hands the way and I can't see and feel anything when I'm not touching, when I'm not looking at it. Yes, we are. And it suddenly, it was like a light coming out of my head. And I went home, and I used to come up to London a lot, rather than spend weekends in Basingstoke. And I spent the next few weeks trawling weekends through bookshops, buying design books. And all sorts of things, strange things happened to me. Around that time, I kept meeting people. I would turn on the TV, and there would be a program about famous designers, and I was thinking, what is going on here? But it, it put a seed in my head. And one of the key days was when I got taken into this very secret uh, suite, if you like, of, of blue foam products that the IBM designers were working on. And it was a quite an exciting day for them because the head of the department and these three designers uh, were all uh, expecting the consultant of IBM's design, a chap called Richard Sapper, who's a very well-known de German designer, to come and spend a day with them. And I was invited into this secret cell that was, and there were lots of very high security bits in IBM that you know, other departments weren't allowed in. And I was laid out into this inner sanctum and saw all the prototypes for all these new designs that which were all highly secret and sensitive and confidential and stuff. And I was sworn to secrecy, even even I'd signed a, an agreement in my own department to not divulge anything I'd seen in there. And I sat in that room, and it was just a load of blue foam products and, and white plaster and so on. And absolutely fascinating. I sat listening to Richard Sapper 
talked to the designers and I was just blown away by the whole thing and I just thought, this is what I need to do. I don't know how talented I am. I don't know where, how I can do this. But it was that sort of release of creativity. Around the same time, I got uh, to know one of the guys, uh, in the, one of the engineers, uh, software engineers that I worked with, um, who was also a photographer. And I asked him if he would help me set up a camera design stand, which I still use today. We did this in 1986, stayed up almost all night in his workshop somewhere outside Basingstoke. Um, and we worked on this thing together, and he understood. And I sort of, once I found the guy who understood the engineering and the photography, that the camera had to be absolutely rock steady at a 30th of a second or a 15th of a second, and it wouldn't give me camera shake, then I had my answer and I still use that rig today and so even though it was probably one of the unhappiest times of my life it was a great job IBM looked after me incredibly well it was a fantastic company to work for I was very very privileged to just happen upon this path and that's really where I got the idea so I rang up Oxford Poly student services while I was at, <laughs> at IBM and said could you send me a list of all the master's degree courses of industrial design in the country, please. And I very cheekily and very naively, I think, um, applied to the Royal College. So just to just keep that link through for my photography, that's the stand that this chap did with me in 1986. And I was using this two weeks ago in Morocco, in the Medina. Um, and it works. It's not very, it's not very pretty, but it works. Um, it's, I've taken it to every country I've ever travelled to. I've beat it around. It's abused and filthy, dirty, and dust covered in dust. And this has allowed me to really see the world, capture the world, and capture motivations work, and brings me into contact with people that I never thought I would do. When I went to Australia in 1982, as part of the first bit of travelling I ever did, and, and ended up being sent home as a quadriplegic. I never thought I'd travel again. Um, little did I know <laughs> I'd become to hate Heathrow. Um, and so it's been an incredible driver and catalyst in my life, but um, it was one of the things that really started leading to me to the RCA. So that application I made was probably very naive, I and mean, only when I got to the interview and I flicked through in the waiting room some of the portfolios that were sitting outside from the industrial design engineering students, and I saw some of the renderings and drawings, they'd, technical drawings they'd done, and I realised that actually I didn't have a chance of getting in. Luckily for me, there was a course called Computer Related Design, which is now named Interactive Design. And I applied for that, just because I thought the link with computing and my job at IBM might help. And I was devastated to learn in the interview that there were only three places. Um, and I said, and they said, what do you want to get out of the college? What do you want to achieve here? And I said, if I think I don't know how talented a designer I am, but I think if I can influence one of the people on my course to be a better, more integrated, inclusive designer in the world, then I think I would have achieved something. And I hope I did that. During my first year, um, a, fry, a, a, a project, a three-week competition project came to us. We were literally turned up at college one day, and on our drawing boards um, was a project for three weeks, design a wheelchair for developing countries. Every year this project came to the college called the Fry Memorial Award, and I noticed on my way in the, this afternoon that Michael Fry has been one of your presidents, and it was Michael Fry that was one of the judges, and it was a, the Fry Memorial Award, and I think in memory of his father, maybe. Um, and it was an idea, the brief that year was from Lord Snowden. He thought of the idea of doing a wheelchair for developing countries because he felt it was needed. But every year the brief, the subject changed. So why that happened to be the year I was at the RCA and Lord Snowden just happened to think of a wheelchair for living countries and I'd used a wheelchair for eight years, I don't know. It was one of those sort of bizarre serendipitous things that happens in life. Simon came over to me on the first morning and said, look, I've travelled a bit in developing countries in Asia and Africa. I've seen a few workshops. You've obviously got a bit of experience using a wheelchair. How about we team up? I said, great. So we did. And we ended up winning the prize. And really, it was a first-year project. It wasn't part of our major 
part two crits or anything, but we were taken for lunch by um, the senior tutors and the judges and said, please don't let this drop. Don't forget about this thing. This is very important, what you've done here. And we just thought it was an, just another project we'd done. Don't leave it in the bottom drawer or in your portfolio. And my time at the RCA was probably the quickest two years blink of an eyelid and you'll miss it. I can remember my whole life. And I just felt at the time, luckily, that a thousand doors were opening in front of me of all these opportunities and meeting incredibly creative people, most of which are far more talented than me. And it was just one of the most amazing experiences. And I was um, really honored to be there and uh, proud, really proud to be a graduate still 20 years later. It's quite scary, it's 20 years ago. But, um, but yeah, it was one of those key things. This is me presenting with Simon on the left there um, with Jeremy Fry, for those of you who remember him, James Jason's early business partner, and Lord Snowden seated there on the right. We'd been up all night finishing this project, as you, most students are. So off, um, uh, we were encouraged not to let this drop, and so we took the college for its word and went to Sir Justin Stevens, who was the rector at the time, um, Simon and I, and said on the last day of term, it was actually my birthday, and said to so Jocelyn, um, we'd like to take a week off the end of next term and the week off the beginning of the term after uh, to go to India and Bangladesh to do this wheelchair thing, just to have a look and see what we've what we've done. Um, and he said, "Sure. How much do you need?" And which we didn't even ask him for. And he funded the thing as well. And I found out about five years later that he actually funded it from his own pocket. So he was the one that really got us going because we couldn't afford to go on that trip. Um, and along that trip, um, I asked Richard Frost, who's now my co-founder and co-partner of the organisation, to come with us. And the three of us went off to India and Bangladesh on that trip. One of the first things that happened to us, we landed in, it was the first proper developing country I'd ever been to as a wheelchair user, or nearly at all, actually. And um, we got to Passport Patrol, handed in three passports, we are all fair-haired and British-looking, and this Bangladeshi passport control man just sort of looks down at the three of us and goes, brothers? And Rich went, no, no, not brothers. Uh, all slightly insulted by the fact that we looked like each other. And, um, and he just sort of gestured over to me and looked at Rich and said, is he a peasant or just abnormal? To which they just <laughs> fell about laughing. I, I laughed as well. And they said, of course he's a peasant, he's from Essex. <laughs> and... Uh, that is rather stuck. So we've we used that title in our first presentation at the college after we'd come back from the trip. But we went off on that trip, and that was really the beginning of our first program in Bangladesh. We went back uh, a year later at the behest of the, of the centre we went to work in um, for a week and lived in this shed here. So you can see Richard on the right, Simon on the left, in our much-needed mosquito nets. And it was very basic. The conditions were very basic. And we set about setting up a workshop or refurbishing the workshop and redesigning the chair that we'd just done at college because we thought it was so awful. Um, but what we had done was left one there. Um, and so we we'd almost had it field tested for a year. And so we went back with uh, a system of mine, Pierre, on the left, right here, and we met another guy there, Nigel. Now, just to put in context what we do, if we take a population of and the need, if you say that roughly 10% of any population is... Um, disabled and 1% of those probably need a wheelchair. There's about 20 million in the world who either need a better chair or something which um, they need today because they haven't got one. And we started off very much based on local production and we spent the first 10 or 12 years going to different countries designing different chairs and I'll show you a quick range of them in a minute. Um, but its motivation had very much had design at its roots and it keeps design at its roots today, 20 years on, even though not all our staff are industrial designers. In fact, the vast majority aren't. And it's not just about product design. It's about project design um, and design of our communications, the way we express what we feel. Um, I'd just like to introduce Richard, who's sitting at the back here, who is you know, the main architect of most of our program design. And these are... These are 
difficult places to work where this work hasn't been done before and without sort of a laterally thought through program that you can persuade a funder to give you 500,000 pounds or a million dollars to spend two years delivering a program, it's not gonna happen. Plus you need to deliver it and make sure it comes in on budget and on time. And inside that will be some products. But that delivery of that and the design of that is really, really important. Because generally none of this stuff's been done before. I mean, we've done it many times now, but generally every country throws up some sort of, you know, challenge. And I read somewhere that um, once, not long after my injury, I read a quote by a social worker which I thought was very apt at the time. Still is, really. It's not only a body that's a shadowed following a spinal cord injury, but an ego and a self-image. And I think in my first couple of years, that's more of what I was dealing with mentally than anything else. Because it doesn't matter what age you have a spinal cord injury, you change. You may not change mentally inside, but your body changes suddenly. And so if you're 15, that's a bit of a difficult time to start dealing with being in a wheelchair. If you're 21, if you're 40, if you're 50, if you're male or female, it doesn't matter. It's always the same. You're to be dealing with a completely different view of yourself, knowing that other people view you differently, because you can tell by the way they look at you, or the way they react to you. And the day I changed from an Everest and Denning chair to something that was designed that I could adapt for me and get the chair to sort of disappear, then it changed my perception of myself and how I felt about going out in the street. And this is what we try and do. And but we try and do it at extremely low cost, below 100 US dollars. And this, I took this picture in 1993. I still use it currently in talks. I took this outside a French, sorry, um, another organization's um, spinal cord in center in Battambang in Cambodia, having just come out of a meeting with them where they told us, my, my colleague, uh, one of our therapists and I, that our design, we'd taken it up there to show them, our design would never last, it wasn't strong enough, and that the chair on the right that they were currently making was the answer to Cambodia's needs. Same wood, same wheels, same cost. Which would you rather prescribe to somebody or give to your child? The chair on the right is meant for kids with spinal cord injury. And that's what you can do with design. With a bit more effort and a bit more thought and a bit more production training, that's what you can do. And that it's not just about giving somebody that's the flashiest thing around or the latest thing. It's not about fashion. It's about giving somebody some, or providing something which people feel like they want to use, not have to use. And when I started getting up in the morning when I had a new chair that I felt proud to be using, I'd look across the room and think, actually, I want to get in there. And when you get teenagers going past, going, wicked chair, mate, where'd you get those wheels? You know, it puts a whole different perspective on disability and the way you feel about yourself. And so it's, it's formed very much with function. It has to be incredibly functional and strong, uh, but it doesn't mean to say it has to be ugly and unesthetic. So we're really about the quality of life of people with mobility disabilities. That's really the essence of what we do. That's our mission. But our values really are the respect for the individual and embracing creativity. And we try and do that through every part of our work. We, we look at our work now in sort of four areas. And obviously the mobility stuff, the products and service and training that we do is, is what we're known for. That's what everybody sort of thinks we do. The bits on the edges are less uh, in terms of the amount of what we do, but that part, peer group training, is very important. The survival part is very important. I was lucky enough uh, to have an injury in a country where I was picked up by helicopter, taken to a spinal injuries unit immediately. Had I been at home in here in England, it would have been pretty much a similar story, but I was lucky to be in, involved in two societies that did that. So we try and be more, just more than just a, a chair provider. The survival issue, you know, this, this, this would be the biggest, literally, pain in the backside for me, because that would mean six months in bed if I got a pressure sore. I could go out and get one tomorrow, because I have no sensation. If I didn't use my cushion or I used it the wrong way up or I didn't care and didn't have this sort of thing running through my head every second of every day. And so that is caused by lack of sensation and lack of turning in hospital. So the person who's got that sore 
hasn't even got to the point of needing a wheelchair. So if we ignore centres that have those issues, then we're not getting, and then we just go in and gaily make wheelchairs, then we're not addressing the situation. We're not getting people to survive. And that would mean six months in bed to me. I couldn't imagine anything more boring. It probably wouldn't kill me. In a developing country, it probably would. And that's what that survival bit is about uh, in our work. And it's simple things like turning regimes in hospitals, in rehab centres, things that we just take for granted and we're taught here. And I got shown lots of nasty pictures like the last one in, when I was being rehabbed. And they said, if you get one of these, you'll be back in here. And I went, no, thank you. <laughs> and um, so, you know, it, it's my biggest fear to get one of those. So we've tried to address that through our design. We design we've designed a range of low-cost cushions because it's one thing to give a wheelchair if you haven't got a cushion. If I don't sit on a cushion, I would get a pressure sore. Simple as that. Within an hour, the beginnings of one. If I do the same thing the next day, I'll get a sore. And if I kept doing it, I'd get one like that last picture. The cushion I sit on, and I'm lucky enough to be living as... Uh, under the health service that provide me with this cushion because they realise that it's saving them a fortune having me back in hospital if I sit on this chair and I'm taught how to use uh, this cushion and I'm taught to use it. It costs 350 400 pounds. We're providing chairs for under 100 US dollars so we need to provide something that has the same properties but for much less. So we've produced this cushion for under $10. It's actually about $7. It has very similar properties. It's adjustable in size and if you're thinking now that David, what an amazing designer and designs all these products, I do not. I'm the one that goes out and blags the money off people now um, to do this stuff. We have a very, very talented team of people we bring together to do this kind of work, to, to bring the product design together. And it's when you take designers out of college or it takes them about a year to get into the whole concept of how low cost this needs to be, but that it doesn't have to be bad and, and you know, cheap and, and nasty. There are, of course, other pro com, um, approaches. Other organizations do it differently. Some just go off to China and buy wheelchairs that are like the Everson Jennings, which is a fine design, as we've said, I've said, but not in that context. It's not the appropriate design for that place, or it's just totally inappropriate for the user. And that both those chairs come from the States, and they do those numbers in big numbers the guy who does the white plastic chairs puts out 150,000 a year. We were setting up workshops in the, in the 90s doing 300 a year. And so there's a huge difference. And when we said, you really shouldn't be giving a plastic chair to people with spinal cord injury, he said, well, you know, there's a lot more people out there that need than spinal injury. And he's got a point. And you guys are great. You do great work, but you don't do it very much. You don't read the numbers. You talk about this 20 billion, um, but you don't do it very often. You're not going to meet that. And so, and that's how often, that's how they often end up. And so it's very important to get the right design in the right context, and that's what we try and do. And we also try and fit things properly, because that's maybe the good design for Russia, maybe not. But it is the right design for that child, certainly isn't. That child feels like an island, I can tell you. And so the assessment of prescription, and this is the service side of what we do, is really important. So taking on the therapist's to work with the design team, which sort of causes clashes and sometimes marriages, um, really is very important because that is the, the essence of what we do. It's not just the hardware, it's the software as well. So just very quickly, some of the designs we've done, I won't go into too much detail, but four wheelchairs are very useful for the urban, more um, built-up environment. Three wheelchairs, we started in Cambodia for disability groups that um, live 85% of them live in the, in the rural area. In fact, 85% of the population were living in rural areas then. Afghanistan for landmine um, survivors. And then through to people who live in villages, rough terrain, and so on. Supportive seating for children with cerebral palsy. This is an issue that always comes up. And it, it, it's a very much needed uh, range of design and seating for children that have very little control on their on their ability to sit up. Um, and tricycles. What would be a leisure item here, a crucial piece of transport for somebody who can't get on the bus or might get charged double to get on a bus. So in Tanzania, you want to get on a bus as a wheelchair user, 
they'll charge you and they'll charge your chair for taking up somebody you could sit on the roof. You call that discrimination, but that's the reality. And so if you can get a, you know, a chair you can move around yourself in. When all these organizations started giving out 150,000 inappropriate chairs a year, we felt there should be something done about it. So we approached the World Health Organization and the International Society of Prosthetics and to cut a very long story short, over five years, we managed to get some guidelines because anybody can go out to any developing country and deliver whatever they like and it seemed as great charity. And that's what we wanted to shift. We wanted to shift it from the people being a passive recipients of charity to development programs. And that's what we've always believed in. Um, and so these guidelines on manual wheelchairs in developing countries are the way you should be delivering chairs. Doesn't this necessarily say that motivation chairs are the best or anything like that? It's about the sort of basic standards of what you can provide and should be providing. And crucially, it says it gives a definition of what an appropriate wheelchair is. Because who was to say the white chair wasn't any better than one of our chairs? And that was a difficult question to answer. We've really tried to raise the bar with what we've done. We've tried to scale it up over the last 10 years by doing a thing called World Made, because we realized we weren't meeting the numbers. And so we've taken all the roots of our designs from the first 10 years and put them into mass manufacturers so we could control the quality and keep the price down. And we've turned this into a social enterprise now so that um, other organizations can come and purchase from us and we deliver the training to them and they can deliver our work for us, if you like. So it spreads our work without us having to expand hugely. So we have organizations like Handicap International, the Inter International Committee of the Red Cross, delivering our chairs to their humanitarian programs worldwide, um, which is great. And so you can see the roots of all these designs coming through. We've also designed a low-cost sports chair. The average sports chair can cost two to three thousand pounds. The International Paralympic Committee approached us and said, "Would you design a low-cost chair that will get people into grassroots, develop the sports? Otherwise, we're going to have a, an elite system of, of countries that can afford good chairs and countries that can't. And the countries that can't won't ever meet the, make, make the Paralympics. So we designed a low-cost chair for two hundred and fifty dollars, um, unshipped." And we've done it for wheelchair tennis and basketball. We thought we might ship about 400 in the first year, from May last year to May this year. We shipped 1,200 because they are just so popular. And we've now had to bring them into the UK because people keep ringing us up saying, how much is that chair? I want one. <laughs> and so we're now marketing this in the UK and over Europe. And 120 have gone to Australia. 180 have gone to Australia, in fact. Um, and so these have proved extremely popular and caught us a bit by surprise, if I'm honest. Um, in terms of what the need was here. Um, and then the trikes, we've, we've redone the trikes for, the, for mass, mass manufacturer too. As I said before, it's about educating the user and making sure that that user really gets to know what the, f what, the, what the disability they're facing means. And we do this through peer training, getting wheelchair users, training other wheelchair users and in the audience somewhere. Uh, Sean is one of our peer trainers who goes out uh, to countries, trains trainers in those countries to pass on the knowledge that we've all been given look, because we've, been, we've had good rehab here, but it doesn't happen in developing countries. So you may go through rehab and never know that you're at risk of a pressure sore if you don't happen to get one. And it, getting one is too late. Prevention is best. And so this is the tipping point of motivation's work. This is where this is where the light comes on for the user because you can give someone the best wheelchair in the world, whether it's appropriate and everything. But if that person isn't motivated to use it and go out and get into the world and be included in society, they're the ones that are going to have to do that. They're not going to do that unless they really feel confident and have the self-esteem and, and, and skills to do it. And it's not just about learning wheelies. It's about feeling good about yourself um, as a person and saying... I'm actually a member of this society and I have a right to be here like everybody else because that doesn't always happen for disabled people in developing countries. I've often heard women in Bangladesh say, we're doubly disabled. Firstly, we're women in a Muslim country and secondly, we have a disability. And it's always firstly, we're women and secondly, we're disabled. So it's not the disability is the big thing, it's the fact they're women. But then when they're disabled as well, that's doubly disabling. So it's really about motivating users to take hold of their life 
and move forward, really. So what has design done for me? I've explained how I got into design, rather strange, haphazard sort of path. Um, it's taken me from this island here. This is the pool I dived into about 30 seconds after this picture was taken. It's taken me from that island in 1982, out of that island, which I received for a year, to this. You might say he's on a desert island there. <laughs> that was actually Morocco in the desert. Um, but it's really, it has, for me personally, opened my life up, it's changed my life, it's enhanced my life. And I hope that's what we've been able to do through motivation. Um, so really, at the end of the day, it's about, it's about being alive. It's about being mobile. It's about being inspired. It's about being useful in society. I feel like I'm useful in society. I've taken a lot from the society, both financially and help-wise, but I'm actually quite proud to be a taxpayer. <laughs> I know that sounds very really strange, but because you know, I'm able to give something back. Um, you know, and it, it's not just what I do, and I happen to have a fantastic job, but it's, it's about the fact that I can actually take part in society and feel I have a say. And design has really helped me do that. And it's taken me from that survival point, you know, from nearly drowning in that pool to being, feeling completely included in society. So I'm really very honoured to get this medal. As Andrew said, I got an MBE early this year, and you think, blimey, what a year for you. This actually means a huge amount because this is, this is peer recognition, and I never thought for a moment. I, when I went to the Royal College, I um, you know, up this. I got Matthew Taylor, the chief exec's letter, on my birthday this year, which was a bit of a significant birthday. Um, and I think... I just want to read you a quote he wrote from the letter because, you know, we've got a lot of... Motivation's had a lot of awards, I've had awards, and it's often about what motivation does in general. But I think this award is really, as Andrew said earlier... It, it gets the nub of what we do and the roots of what we do. Um, and he wrote that the impact motivation have had not only increasing the mobility of disabled people, but also for the contribution to their social and economic re rehabilitation. Um, motivation has clearly demonstrated how design can reveal and answer deeper social needs than wheelchair users alone. Wheel, sorry, wheelchair use alone. And I think when I read that, I thought, Yes, that, that's got to the root of what we do. And so many people don't see that because they don't get the design bit. They don't know what industrial design is. They don't, it doesn't matter that it started at the Royal College and an art school, but it does. And, and that's why this award really means a lot. So I'd just like to thank the profession, the Royal College particularly, um, and the RSA for this award. It's really very proud to get it. Thank you. Well, I think behalf of everyone here tonight and behalf of everyone who will be listening online, um, thank you, David, for sharing just a little of an insight into an absolutely fascinating, fascinating journey. Um, I'm very, very honoured to have the opportunity to um, hold the space for the next 30 minutes and uh, pose you a couple of questions which have been burning in the back of my mind, but also to offer the audience a chance to um, raise their hands and in a moment ask some questions which I'm sure we'll all be eager to hear the answers to. Um, but just to kick us off, to start with um, something you mentioned towards the end of your presentation there. Um, how important do you think it is at the moment where you know, green issues and, and peak oil are, are something in the, in the back of the so-called developed world's mind, that we do exactly what it seems your sports chair has done and actually go back a little bit um, ourselves into grassroots design and appropriate design and maybe decouple this sense that things that are uh, lower tech or, or cheaper are for someone else, mm. but maybe bring them closer to home, bring them into the UK, into the developed markets. Well, that's been the nice thing about the sports chair for us because it, it has really taken the whole thing back to the beginning because, you know, just as 
using that example, sports chairs have become incredibly sophisticated, incredibly expensive, to the point where they are so good, they lock people out who just want to try something. You don't buy your teenage child of the best Roger Federer tennis racket, do you, when they're just starting out and they're first coaching, then you buy them an old, or give them your old one. And when they're interested, you start moving on up. And that's really what that design is doing, is getting people introduced to things. So I think, I think you're right. You, you, you can actually take, strip back things and get um, back to basics and do things very low cost. And it, it doesn't have to be devalued by it looking terrible like that wooden chair from the organization um, in Cambodia. Um, because, you know, we've proved you can do it. And for, for some time, I, I, and this is going to sound a bit odd, I did sort of worry that no one really took us seriously because what we were doing was low cost. People thought it was a great idea. But in terms of design, I always thought, well, it's, you know, it's not the sort of top of the range type thing, so people don't recognize it as being that good. Right. They thought it was quite innovative, but, you know, and it, it wasn't for about, I'd say, in, in our sector, in the international development world, overseas, it wasn't for some time that we got taken seriously as an organization. We were just these sort of slightly naive, exuberant young guys. Um, and it really sort of started changing in, in the sort of early, mid-2000s when people recognized what motivation was doing in terms of the products we were producing and the way we did things to be, um, to be the, to one, you know, the main right way of doing it. And so we did build a reputation over that. And uh, but we only did that by sticking to our guns and keeping things simple and low cost. Speaking about the, the way you do things at Motivation and the very specific set of criteria you went about creating products with, um, we were speaking just before we came through to the hall today about the breadth of application this type of design actually has um, for a population that is aging, for... Um, a population that is, is, is changing in terms of its needs and what it can utilize um, from the Earth, from the planet. Um, so how do you see this, this design ethos, which in many ways you were pioneering, um, becoming more mainstream and, and moving out of specified design areas and just becoming something that is just yeah. good design? I think it needs to, definitely. Um, I mean, we've done it because because of the, the need and, and, the, and the necessity to do that. But there's no reason why, in a context that doesn't necessarily or can afford different, it, it, um, it has to be that way. You, know, you certainly strip things right back and, and look at things right from the beginning and make things low cost. It, you know, people tend to value things because they're expensive. It doesn't have to be that way, necessarily. Um. Okay, and this is, uh, forgive me, a slightly uh, indulgent question, but coming from um, a background of a, a social enterprise which is also creating design, mm. um, and a young one at that, I am fascinated by the fact you seem to have achieved what is a social enterprise holy grail in that you've achieved scale. You're now in 30 countries? Yes, each. although we weren't doing those, th we didn't, th those 30 countries have been over around some 19 years. Absolutely, but, but the world may translate it. program, you know, has scaled up what we can do, and we'll probably do uh, eighteen thousand products this year, of varying, you know, not all chairs, some cushions, some trikes, some and sports chairs. Um, whereas it probably took us, in our first ten years, we added up all the chairs that probably were produced by the workshop we would set up over those ten years. We probably did around 18,000 to 20,000 chairs, or the, the workshops we'd set up had. So, you know, that was a that world-made system was a real step change, and we did a lot of soul searching about it at the beginning uh, we, when we started around 2000, because you know we'd always advocated, and I've been out talking about it for 10 years, local production, mm -hmm. and so to suddenly, you know looked like an organization that completely done a U-turn and said, no, no, we're going to make them in China. Um, but it was, you know, we went through it and it's actually a development of what we're doing because we kept our feet on the ground. We didn't know anything about 
designing for mass manufacture. We didn't know about going to Chinese factories and talking, you know, pricing and all this logistics and all that kind of thing. We've learned that over the last 10 years with a lot of help from people, a lot of companies who've given their time and money. Um, but that scaling up and then turning it into a social enterprise because it was a constant struggle to raise the money. That's why it's taken 10 years because you had to stop and start and stop and start mm. to design the products because you couldn't get the money to design them. Um, and then once you've got them designed and got them being manufactured, how can you keep the number of products coming out to keep the price down? The only way is to fuel it by buying products. And the, if we couldn't raise the money to buy the products, then we couldn't do that and so it, it was a bit of a vicious circle now we've got other organizations coming to us and saying we want to buy a container of your chairs and we want you to train us to deliver it and that that is now what we're doing we'll still support local production if people really make a case to do it and there's a real need and a lot of our workshops for example in Afghanistan and Cambodia both make a thousand and twelve hundred chairs respectively um, run by other organizations, not us. But, and they're still producing locally very successfully. But there are other situations where the quality would drop, and that's what we want to try and avoid, because at the end of the day, the user suffers, not the workshop. So do you think it was um, vital for the company's development that you did go about it that way, that you did begin with local, local manufacture and move to mass? Did you, are there any unique uh, learnings? Yes, no, I think it was absolutely crucial we did that. We cut our teeth for those first 10, 12 years you know, redesigning chairs and changing things and making a, a chair a development of the last chair or changing it completely. You know, we went off to Bang, uh, Bangladesh and we designed a range of chairs out of old, really bad quality sort of old water pipe. You had to use 28 inch wheels. Most chairs are 24 in this context or in our context. Um, and they were the only wheels available. And then we went into Poland the year after and we had these photographs of this chair we'd done and we showed all these Polish wheelchair users. They immediately turned around and said, well, we don't, we don't want your Asian chair. We want what you've got. We want what they produce in Sweden or the States. And we want it for under $200, thanks. And we want quick release wheels so we can get in our cars. And we want, um, you know, and we're not a developing country, by the way. This is Europe. This is 1992 in Poland. It was pretty developing. But, you know, they had a point. They knew what they wanted, and that's what we had to design for. And the same in Nicaragua. We went there following the revolution, and, and there were some very vocal and uh, active wheelchair users that knew exactly what they wanted. They wanted a chair they could play sport in and use every day because they knew they'd only be able to afford one. So we had to meet that criteria. And so without doing all that stuff, I don't think we've, we'd have gone off to some factory and produce something completely inappropriate. So, yeah, that was crucial.